Welcome to the Jack Hopkins Show podcast, where stories about the power of focus and resilience are revealed by the people who live those stories. And now, the host of the Jack Hopkins Show podcast, Jack Hopkins. Hello and welcome to the Jack Hopkins Show podcast. I'm your host, Jack Hopkins. Today I have two guests with me both very bright and intelligent individuals, but as you'll find out, both very likable, which is always nice. Jess Piper is the executive director for Blue Missouri and hosts a weekly podcast called Dirt Road Democrat. She was an American literature teacher for 16 years, and after the 2016 election of Trump, Jess became politically active. She ran for office in 2022 for state representative in Northwest Missouri. She was not successful, however, she used this experience to organize progressives in rural Missouri. My second guest is Mr. Chris Jones. Chris is a retired research engineer from the University of Iowa. He studies and writes about agriculture, the environment, and water. ModeShift.org said this about Chris Jones. Because he writes with grace and style, reports with precision, and has a platform tied to the University of Iowa, nobody has attracted more attention to the causes and sources of farm-related pollution than Chris Jones. Now, they're here to talk about farm-related issues, more specifically, and, and primarily water, safe water. But they're also here to talk about an event they have coming up August 7th. Join Jess Piper and Chris Jones for a conversation on clean water and rural decline. Wednesday, August 7th, 6 p.m. at Big Grove Brewery in Iowa City, Iowa. And also might mention that they both write on Substack. Jess writes The View from Rural Missouri, and Chris is the author of Swine Republic, Struggles with the Truth About Agriculture and Water Quality. Now, I have to tell you, although I grew up in a rural area, my parents were not farmers. My grandparents farmed, but I was not a farm kid per se. So I learned a lot of things today. And one thing I learned was our water in rural areas is in trouble. One other thing I learned was our land is being misused. And big money plays a a big role in the misuse of our land and the resulting pollution to our water. So with that, let's get right into this podcast so maybe you can learn something new as well. All right. Well, as I said earlier, I'm, I'm so glad to have you both here today. Uh, I've been guilty of, of focusing exclusively on the national the presidential election, which is critically important, of course, but there are issues at home for all of us in our own local area, and you're both here today to, to talk about some of those issues, and more specifically, clean water and rural decline. So, Chris, let me let me let you kick it off. I know uh, you write Swine Republic, Struggles with the Truth About Agriculture and Water Quality. Let me ask you, what what prompted you to, to start this newsletter? Well, you know, I'm, uh, I'm an Iowan. I'm from Iowa. I grew up in the Des Moines area. My folks are both from rural Iowa. And so I'm concerned about my state. And, you know, we were, lo- we were losing our young people here in Iowa. Um, we see uh, about 70 out of our 99 counties are losing population. Um, you know, we have these issues at the national scale, of course, that you've talked about there. 
uh, about urban versus rural. And so I think Iowa is sort of a crystallization of that. We've had a decline in, in our rural areas uh, with the consolidation of agriculture, uh, people moving to the cities or moving out of the state. And so I think what's happened here in Iowa is really key, especially for the Democratic Party, if they're going to try to uh, get votes from rural areas, right, make inroads into rural Iowa and rural America, we need to understand what's going on. And as I said, I think Iowa is a crystallization of that, uh, what's happening at the national scale. Right. And, and, and do you think that's why the Iowa caucus has always been such a, a, a national nationally recognized big event is because Iowa does kind of represent so much of the well, rest of the nation? You know, <laughs> if you're a white person in America, uh, <laughs> Iowa sort of represents what you remember, right, uh, from your childhood. Sure. Uh, you know, the sure. heartland sort of theme and the uh, rugged agrarian scratching out a living against all odds on the prairie. You right. know, that's America, right? That's what you think of America as. Right. You no, know, America's not really that anymore. Uh, but I think people had a fascination with the Iowa caucus that, you know, it was the first and this is the America w that we remember. And so, you know, that first in the nation status was deserved because of that. Sure. I'm not sure that's right anymore, but uh, for sure the Iowa caucus has definitely uh, contributed to the national perception of the state. Yeah, absolutely it has. Um, Jess, I, first of all, I'll, I'll ask you, do, do you want to, to, to talk about at all your experience this morning or would, would you? Okay, because yeah. I, I think it's important for people to know. Before we get into what Jess was ready to come on here and talk about, she had a pretty jolting experience this morning. One that is happening at a quicker and quicker rate throughout our nation, coast to coast. We're hearing about it more often, and it's got deadly, deadly potential consequences. So Jess, could you share with us what happened? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it's it's weird because I had just read an article about the rise of political violence, um, I think in the Atlantic, and uh, went outside and was doing my gardening, and I saw a sheriff's deputy kind of creeping up into my long driveway, and I was like, well, here we go. Someone's probably suing me for <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but he got out and started asking me about my kids, which sent me into a panic because I have four adult children. And um, anyway, we found out that someone had made some terrible accusations uh, to send the police to my house this morning. Luckily, I live in a very small town and the deputy who showed up lived just down the road for me. Um, he's very well aware of my politics and, you know, things that go on. Um, and so he had some questions for me um, and then asked to see, you know, my family members to make sure that everybody was OK. But um, it's swatting um, is what it's called when someone, you know, makes a false report to send uh, basically the SWAT department to your house uh, to terrorize you. Maybe. I mean, you don't know. These things have ended up with people being shot and killed. Right. Yes, you don't have. put your hands up at the right moment or whatever. Um so it's a form of political violence. It happened to me and nobody from nowhere. Um, and so we're in scary times. Um, you know, I talked about it. My immediate reaction was to shut down and cry somewhere. <laughs> sure, but, sure. I, you know, I, I have my husband and my son and my kids. And um, so then I thought, you know, I should tell the story to tell them that they didn't do what they wanted to do. I wasn't they didn't send the SWAT department out. Um, and somebody on Twitter said, you know, the Jason Aldean sign or uh, uh, song, try that in a small town. <laughs> right. Right. Which is an inoffensive song, but I was like, exactly. I mean, it doesn't work the same way here that it would in Kansas city, but um, you know, I'm not laughing about the political violence uh, that, that um, is occurring more and more. And it's really dangerous to people, especially for someone who doesn't look like me. Right. Right. Um, Absolutely. So. And and that that's a great point. That's a great point. Because we can rest assured that if you were a person of color, 
the, the, the law enforcement officer coming up your driveway, even unconsciously, and we know this through scientific studies, uh, Malcolm, Malcolm Gladwell talks about it in one of his books, that unconscious bias that has been created in the country, and there is this proclivity to shoot quicker or to, to pull the trigger when, when you would not have. So, yes, I mean, as crazy as it sounds, and I suppose if, if you are a person of color listening to this, it probably doesn't even sound crazy to you. But to somebody like us in the rural Midwest, um, to say, wow, being white this morning might have might have been the difference. So, yeah, the political violence, as we should point out, because I, I think it is important to, to point out, it, it, it's largely one-sided. You know, Democrats, Democratic leadership, we, we don't have somebody that's hitting the stage and stoking violence. We don't have uh, voters, Democratic voters, online calling for violence or, you know, posting pictures of ourselves and our family with guns, you know. So when uh, we talk about political violence, there's, there's one side that's being persecuted and one side, for the most part, that's um, doing the, the damage, doing the, the threats. And the, as you mentioned, there have been deaths. So I wanted to make sure, if you wanted to, to get this in on this podcast. Yes, so and I, I'm so sorry. I have to take one moment away to unlock my door because my husband is here. Can you clip this part real quick? Okay, right. One Let, second. Letting a spouse in might be an important thing. <laughs> so Chris and I, we'll, we'll chat a little more. Uh, but let's talk about rural water. Mm -hmm. Because uh, having grown up, I, my grandparents were farmers, but my, my parents were not. So I, I wasn't a farm kid, per se. I just lived where farm kids lived. Rural water is the lifeblood of a small community. So, sure. And so, you know, so much of our land here in Iowa is committed to agricultural production, right? And so we have about 85% of our land is in some form of production. And so we have a, a really terrible problem here in Iowa with nutrient pollution. Nitrate, nitrogen is a regulated drinking water, drinking water, a parameter for municipal water supplies. But we have about 7,000 private wells in Iowa that have been contaminated with nitrate above the safe drinking water limit. And so that's a manifestation of the economic activity that's taking place on the countryside, right? And so right. Uh, corn production, especially for ethanol, but also for livestock feed, um, the fertilization of the corn is what results in these contaminated wells. And so it's not urban people. Uh, that really suffer here. Uh, Des Moines has a uh, impaired water supply, but the city of Des Moines has the capacity to cope with this problem on a right. financial uh, basis. If you live in a small town of a thousand people and your well is contaminated, that is a burden, right? right. That's a huge burden for a, for a town to deal with something like that. And so the uh, burden of this agricultural production in Iowa and elsewhere, it falls mainly on rural people. And this is something that I think uh, both political parties have just uh, not been able to get their head around. Right. Jess, I'd, I'd like for you to contribute to this as well. Uh, you you live, at, at, as we would say, in the sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, so tell us from your perspective, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the, I, I think of water is the lifeblood of rural communities. What's your take on rural water and challenges that we face? 
I think it's really important to note for your listeners that Chris is doing something that um, it takes a lot of moxie. He's speaking out against big ag. Um, they have uh, kind of captured both parties. Um, they are doing things that are poisoning rural people. And Chris had the audacity to write it down and to tell us what's happening. When he talks about these nitrates, I mean, he talks, he's talking about cancer causing agents. Um, right. He knows that, you know, I think Iowa has the second largest rate or increase of, of cancers in the country in Iowa. And so I think when people look at the heartland and look in places in the center of the country and think of this, you know, idyllic space, they don't understand what big agriculture has done to our spaces. When they talk about farmers in general, they're talking about, you know, corporations that own 5,000 acres. They're not talking about someone trying to, you know, make a living off the land with 60 acres, right? Because that's what we envision. And what Chris is talking about is almost taboo. And the fact that he's come out so forceful in this is really something that we have to admire because our water, that's all we have, clean air and clean water. Missouri in 2019 took away local uh, regulations of CAFOs, which are concentrated animal uh, feeding operations. So think of these huge barns that are holding cows or hogs or, you know, chickens or turkeys. And so they produce just millions of gallons of waste that has to go somewhere, right? right. So they're putting them in these big lagoons telling us that, oh, it's not going to leak out. You know, that's not going to get in your water. It absolutely does get into your water. And I'll tell you something real personal. I was out gardening this morning and my neighbor from across the street came over and she was looking at my flowers. She said, I'm worried about my tomatoes. And I was like, why? You always have, like, she has these beautiful tomatoes. She said, because the crop duster came over last week and I swear they dropped some on our house. And I was like, Fern, I just accused my husband of killing my flowers next to um, one of the beds. Because, and he was like, I didn't put anything there, Jess. And I was like, well, somebody did something. And now I'm like, crap they're dropping it out of the <laughs> out of the airplanes aren't they right, right. I, I, to that uh, about three blocks to the south of me oh there's probably 100 acres that gets dusted gets crop dusted and last year i was out in the backyard i was mowing and i I could hear them, and when they leave the airport, which is fairly close by, you know, you you see them come over. So I knew they were crop dusting, and at, at some point, I could smell it. I could smell it, and no big deal. I said, oh, they're crop dusting, but the, the, the further I mowed, I thought, if I can smell it, then it's reaching my lungs. If it's reaching my lungs, it's reaching my circulatory system. This is not an ideal situation. Uh, so, Chris, if we could talk for a moment about uh, the, the cancer aspect of it. It's been probably 10 years ago, and I had stopped at Cracker Barrel in Columbia, Missouri. And as often happens with people, I, there was a gentleman sitting next to me, and we struck up a conversation. While I cannot remember his name, he taught and was a professor at Missouri MU, Missouri University. And we eventually landed on the topic of what you, you are here to talk about, the things that are winding up in our water and its impact on our health. And none of it was good. Can, can you share a little bit with me? So just mentioned, Iowa has the second highest cancer rate in the United States. We're the only state, the only state out of 50 where the cancer rate is increasing and you know we have the most the highest percentage of our land in agricultural production out of any state as i said earlier 85 percent of our land and so we've known you know people are treating this like it's uh, new a new finding no it's not we've known for a long time that these things that we're doing here in agriculture in iowa have consequences for human health and so um EPA has a limit on uh, municipal drinking water for nitrate of 10 parts per million. We know there are health risks uh, associated with drinking uh, high nitrate water down to three parts per million. Okay, the limit uh, for cities is 10 parts per million. We know three parts per million has an effect. We know 
we've known for a long time, 20 years or more, that kids that go to school near CAFOs have doubled the risk of asthma in Iowa. We've known that. We know that uh, women drinking uh, nitrate above about five parts per million have a higher incidence of birth defects, uh, of giving birth to a child with birth defects. We've known these things for a long time. This is not new, but yet the industry has such a death grip on the legislature here and on on the politics and on the economics and so many other things that we don't talk about these things, right? Right. People hear these like, oh, wow, when did we find this out? Well, 20 years ago. Well, why haven't we done anything? Well, it's because the industry keeps the uh, legislature and the rest of our government from doing anything. So what are, if if we were going to look at what, What's one thing? Well, I was going to say to you, let's just look at one thing. If there was one thing that would be a a positive and measurable step in the right direction on addressing this, what would it be? Well, you know, the the corn soy system that we have that's uh you know predominant not just in Iowa but throughout the corn belt, you know, from the Dakotas to um Western Ohio um, is it's largely unregulated, right? And so we have a massive amount of land committed to this economic activity, and the pollution is not regulated from it. And so we need to regulate the pollution like we do every other industry in the United States. On an economic perspective, we have a massive amount of land committed to the use to produce corn for fuel ethanol. This is probably the dumbest natural resource decision this country has ever made, is to commit all this, the best farmland on earth to the production of corn for ethanol. It does not produce a greenhouse gas benefit. It does not really clean up the air anymore after we've improved the emission standards for automobiles. There's only one reason we do this, and it's, it's just a luxury economic activity. And so in Iowa, we have 60% of our corn go to ethanol. We have an area of land, 11,000 square miles, that we use to produce corn for ethanol. That's the size of 20 counties. So 20% of our state is used to do this. And why are we doing this? It pollutes our water. There's really no environmental benefit. We're the largest oil-producing country on earth now. We export oil. Why are we doing this? It's just to line the pockets of millionaires. Right. We need to get rid of ethanol for vehicles. Thank you for that, because I I learned something here that I, I didn't know. And I think that's the, 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 the whole idea behind a podcast for me is that people watch or listen, and then they come away with something they didn't know before that with that knowledge that can help contribute to the, the solutions. All right, so Jess, you had mentioned Chris's moxie on taking big ag on, and I was curious, is your moxie, because I know you have it, I watch you on social media, is that just part of who you are, your your personality and identity, or is that something that once you got into politics and were dealing with the issues you were, you said, you know, I'm I'm going to have to push myself to be a little edgier. Well, I was born and raised in evangelical, so I was born to be quiet, <laughs> keep sweet okay. and obey. However, um, once I started paying attention to politics, I realized that there was no pushback. A lot of times Democrats don't feel good about going in and saying the things that need to be said. And so I felt like if nothing else, somebody needs to tell the truth and, and say what's going on around us. I mean, when I looked around, I was a teacher for 16 years. I, I was making $41,000 a year with a master's degree. Right. I was having to um, make sure that my kids had their, their supplies. I was dipping into my pocket all the time to do these things. And so I started looking at state policies and I was like, oh, Missouri's 50th in teacher pay, 49th in educational funding. Who's doing this? And then I look at the fact that the Missouri GOP has been in in power for 22 years. So, you know, connecting the dots. Um, And then I realized that my neighbors 
weren't connecting the dots. And so it just, it was born out of, I think as rural folks, we just say things plainly and just say what needs to be said. And that's what I hear all the time from people. They, they're not trying to be rude when they read my writing, but they're like, you just say things simply. Right. And I'm like, well, I'm just telling you just the facts, just the truth about what's going on, right? No right. need to embellish it. Um, and so I think it came from that. And now with the pushback I get, I know it's because they need people like me to be silent. They don't want anyone to know that people like me and people like Chris exist in rural spaces. They want everyone to think that we're a monolith. We're all Republicans. We're all going to, you know, toe the line. And we absolutely are not. Um, we know in Missouri, we vote for progressive ballot initiatives. Here's the thing about Missouri. We have a complete and total abortion ban and we have recreational weed. Like there's, there's no right. rhyme or reason to what is going on, right? It, it, um, it and is so, when, you, when you put it that way, it, it, you know, it's like, wow. Right. Yeah, and, and there's something about, I, I admire both of you, in, in particularly in that sense that you speak out, because as we all three know, when you talk about the kind of issues that we do and, and as bluntly as we do, you stand out, and not in the way that you always wanted to when you were a kid. Uh, there are a lot of people that don't feel like we do, and it in this era, it presents a, the potential for danger. It's something that's always in the back of my mind, I, I will say that. Chris, do you encounter any any pushback either directly or indirectly from big ag well um the answer to that is yes i had i've had several members of the legislature um try <laughs> try to shut me up and in fact uh two of them about a year ago asked the university where i work the university of iowa to do something about me and i kind of got tired of it and i decided to retire and so i'm retired now um but you know i, I I don't have a sheriff's deputies coming up to my house, you know, with guns drawn, like right. Jess. But, um, you know, people, I think the whole courageous thing is a little bit overplayed, I feel, for me anyway. I think, you know, people always say I'm outspoken. Well, no, I just say I'm spoken. <laughs> you know, right. I'm not outspoken, I'm just spoken. Yes. I'm just talking about it. And True. people make the make the choice not to talk about these things in an honest and direct way, that's the choice, right? The choice right. isn't to be great, courageous or uh, honest or whatever. I think the choice is the other direction. And so I feel, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really uh, get any satisfaction out of people telling me I'm courageous. And look, I was just trying to sleep at night. Right. I was I was a public servant. I was paid by the taxpayer uh, to do what I did. And so I felt like I needed to do that in ways that contributed to the common good. Right. That's, that's a great if you're, point. If you're a public servant and you're not doing that, that's the choice you're making. Right? True. That's the choice you're making. And so, True. look, I'm I'm happy that people. Uh, don't say I'm a coward, but I'm also, I'm also not, uh, I don't derive a lot of satisfaction from people saying, you know, what I've done is real courageous. Uh, look, I'm a, tra I'm trained as a scientist. Scientists are trained to uh, figure out what the truth is, right? When right. it comes to nature, right? Uh, when it comes to nature in the universe, that's our tra training is to figure out what the truth is and then communicate that to our peers and others. And so that's what I did. And I, since you brought that up, I, I think this is important for the listeners, that one of the major tenets of, of a scientific approach is that when you start down a path, your hypothesis needs to, needs be, to be falsifiable. Okay. And so what, what that means for anybody listening is it has to be possible, possible throughout your study to determine that your hypothesis is wrong, that what you may have thought or uh, where you thought you were going turns out something completely different. And so it's been particularly sad for me 
starting back with COVID, and of course, long before that, but it was amplified through COVID, the attack on science. Because here we are in this technological age where science is such a critical part as it expands in its capabilities. And as that's happening, it's being attacked as though it's it's something evil. It, it's something wrong. So the people that we go to when we, okay, you know, I've got this hunch, I've got this theory, I believe this, my mom thinks that, but we go to the scientist and say, what does science say about this? And that's where we sort out all of the people in the periphery. But but this whole COVID thing got to where now the go-to person is the bad guy if you listen to that approach. So I, I thank you for pointing out that you're a scientist because scientists are what takes us forward. That's that's what moves the, the needle. Well, people don't understand that we're wrong a lot. You know, they think, oh, you know, you, you, you're you right. You think you're right all the time. No, we don't. We, we're trained to, you know, know that we're wrong a lot. And so, you know, there was so much, uh, you know, dissatisfaction with Fauci, right, during COVID. And, right. you know, he would say, look, we don't know. We don't know. We don't have all the answers. But then once, you know, we do start accumulating the data and stuff does become uh, cons a consensus within the scientific community, then that tends to be really uh, th those conclusions tend to endure, right? Right. Once you have the consensus. And so like in Iowa with the water, well, we've, we've been studying this for half a century now, right? And so right. we're pretty sure, we're pretty sure we're right on what the causes are and what the consequences are and all these other things. And would, wouldn't it be fair to say, Chris, that also that some of the biggest breakthroughs and advances in U.S. history have come from scientists being wrong and and that it, it opens up a, a whole new uh, pathway that leads to. So we're something. never we're never sure that we're right. That's the scientific <laughs> method. You can never right. be sure that you're right. You right. can only be, you know sure that you're not wrong and and so that's how we do science that's how it's been done you know since the reformation and so th that's what we do and i think people there's a real uh, even among scientists i think there's not a real solid understanding amongst many of them about the scientific method and so you know the lingo of science like it's a theory right and so the public will take that word and say Oh, well, it's only a theory. Well, you know, in science, a theory is pretty, <laughs> once you get to the theory stage, it's pretty rock solid, right? Well, right. And so we have politics and politicians that, are, you know, they take advantage of what science is and what, you know, our, our methods and our processes, and they take advantage of the uncertainty to communicate messages, which is really unfortunate. Yes, it is. Jess? kind of along the same lines as what Chris was talking about. When you are out and about, when you are talking to people out in the communities, do you find, whether it's stated as clearly as I'm about to state it, do you find that a lot of the resistance comes down to profits? That somebody somewhere is making a lot of money and that the changes that that need to be made, but up hard against the people making that money. Yeah, I mean, I I wish that we didn't have money in politics. I mean, that Citizens United has been a death knell for um, for rural activists, for rural people. Um, you know, when I first went to speak with Chris in a couple places, I was invited, and I thought. Why did they invite me? He's a chemist <laughs> and he's speaking about water quality. And I'm a literature teacher who ran for office. But then I was like, 
We're both fighting for the same things. We see a decline in rural America. We see um, people walking away, putting their hands up and saying, it's not worth it to try it out here, right? Right. Um, And so like the guy I ran against, you know, a nice guy, but he took thousands of dollars from a local school privatization place, right? I mean, they don't, they know I'm for public schools and keeping public schools open because you know what? Give me 20 vouchers. What's it matter? There's no place to take my kid and there's no private school coming to rural America to enroll 46 kids, right? There's no profit in that. So again, we just keep getting left behind. And so when they poison our water, when they poison our air, they're like, eh, you know, there's seven people out there. What do we care? Right? We do care and America cares. And Chris can tell you, Chris is a wealth of information. I interviewed him for my own podcast and he was saying, we grow so much corn, we could be growing potatoes and cherries. And and I was like, oh my God. And another thing, Iowa, 90% of the food that lands on an Iowan's plate is from a different state. They are importing food into Iowa to eat. Like everybody's head should be exploding from that. I talked about that and somebody said, well, I don't think Iowa soil is good for carrots. (laughs) Of course you could grow carrots in Iowa. They can grow everything they need. But the point of the matter is it's big ag that has taken over and taken these, you know, this huge, massive amount of good black dirt and turned it into gas. And and into something that we don't need. I've seen play, I've seen corn being put in in shirts, in clothing, in makeup. Like they're putting it everywhere because they are overgrowing it, right? And right. we're all, by the way, every single person listening to this is subsidizing that, and everyone yep. should realize that as well, right? So it's right. just this constant churning of it doesn't have to be this way, and that's why. If we had a Chris in every state who would come forward and say, we can grow everything that Iowans need to eat. We don't need to do these things and also poison our water, right? We can have clean air, clean water, and all the food we need. Yeah. I want to thank you for bringing that up, Jess, because in doing so, you reminded me of a question that I have for Chris when he was talking initially. And that is, as a scientist, as somebody that crunches data and numbers that I think you said 11 million acres was was that a 11,000 square miles of our state 11,000 square miles I was 56,000 square miles 11,000 of it is used to produce corn for ethanol okay what what does that do then to the production Now, now I know anybody listening can can do math and say well it reduces it but in clearer terms than that what does that do to food production not only for iowa but areas outside of iowa so one reason why iowa is good and missouri and other corn belt states are good for growing things is because there's adequate moisture and a real favorable climate and so when we grow uh, things here <laughs> that are just uh, sort of luxury items, as I said, you know, growing corn for ethanol, that's a luxury economic activity. Then the production of food items moves to other places. And so, for example, Iowa was once the number one apple producing state, believe it or not. We used to produce more apples than any other state. We also produce more oats than any other state. We produce more sorghum than any other state. And so we have these other crops. Well, now that we've committed everything to corn and soybeans, uh, some of these other things have moved, especially west. And so we look, where where do we grow apples now? We grow grow them in Washington, eastern Washington. Well, it's a desert. And so you got to irrigate it. Uh, We look at um, irrigation in the American Southwest for agriculture. We hear about the Colorado River going dry, right? Right. Los Angeles, Phoenix, Las Vegas are going to run run out of river, one run out of water. Half half of the Colorado River goes to irrigate alfalfa. Well, that alfalfa that is then exported to Saudi Arabia and China. Well, alfalfa is a crop we used to grow in Iowa, right? Without irrigation, and so why don't we grow it here anymore? Well, it's because we're growing. All, you know, all our land is being used for corn. Uh, to produce ethanol for the renewable fuel standard. 
We look at western uh, Kansas, western Nebraska. Well, when I was growing up, that was wheat country. Well, you know, now the world we've seen with uh, Putin invading Ukraine, uh, they grow a lot of wheat in Ukraine. And so, you know, there's been shortages of wheat. Well, we don't grow much wheat here anymore. Why? We're growing corn out there and we're irrigating it with the Ogallala Aquifer. We're sucking the Ogallala Aquifer dry. It takes 6,000 years to naturally uh, replenish it. Why are we doing this? It's stupid. It's insane. And it's only to line the pockets of millionaires. And this does not help. This sort of production does not help rural people. Okay, 11,000 square miles in Iowa used to grow corn for ethanol. We have 7,000 jobs here in the ethanol industry. So that's less than one job per square mile, the best farmland on earth. That doesn't sound too good to me. No, no. It, I, this, this question, Chris, that pertains to that, and I don't know, so I'm, I'm truly curious. When you look at, say, corn versus alfalfa versus wheat, do different crops require and utilize and need to grow varying de degrees of water? Yes. And so corn is our, our most polluting crop. And so corn costs, it costs more to grow corn. The seeds are very expensive. The GMO seeds are expensive. It takes a lot of fertilizer, which is costly. It takes a lot of other chemicals that are costly. It has to be dried, which is takes a lot of energy and is, you know, big business just to, to dry the grain. And so the inputs for the different crops are different. And so, for example, I mentioned oats. We were once the top oat producing state. Well, guess what? You get much better environmental outcomes with oats than you do with corn. We have here in Iowa the largest oat processing facility in the world in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. They don't use any Iowa oats. They bring in all the oats from Canada. Why are we doing this? It does not make sense. It's stupid. And it's just so the establishment elite can earn money off of corn and ethanol production. Yes. <laughs> What do you tell people when you encounter this resistance? And when you're talking to just say a neighbor or somebody that you see at the grocery store and they come back with, well, it, it, it's maddening, but it's big money. And what can you do? How, how do you reply to somebody like that? So this is, like Chris was saying, this might be new information for some people, but if I talk to my neighbors, they know what's going on. They can see. They all, I'm sitting in a house that's 125 years old. It used to sit on 400 acres. The people who owned it farms the 400 acres. It's been parceled out and now it's it's gone to some guy who lives in Nebraska, right? Who just, right. Who just mails it in. Um, but everybody around me knows what's going on. They know what big farming has done. They know that their kids cannot come back to rural Missouri because you can't afford the land because it costs $17,000 because it's tillable per acre. Like they yes. know this. Um, and so that's where it's it's a lot of education. When I'm knocking on doors, somebody will come out and, and talk about the state of our roads, which are absolutely awful. Missourians spend an extra $700 a year than other states be on, on road maintenance because our roads are so terrible. And so they'll talk about the fact that we don't have any shoulders. And I don't know if you, you guys, well, I know Chris does, and probably you do too, if you meet, uh, if you meet a combine, on a highway, you're in trouble, right? There's nowhere to go, but they For don't sure. care about that stuff. So when I talk to my neighbors, I always just try to connect the dots. This is because we've been left behind. This is because they don't care about our community. They're gutting our schools. They're closing our hospitals, right? They're doing all these things because they don't care. And then every one of these Republicans, I get texts all the time, emails all the time about how they stand up for rural folks. And I want to say, how, how do right. you do that? All you're doing is taking money from these. And by the way, like my husband and I, 
we have just a tiny little farm, but we had enough to do hogs, to raise hogs. We sell them online, and this is why, because they have taken away all of the infrastructure for small farmers to get their animals to the market. Yes. There's nowhere we could sell it. And I so when people here. think, when they think of farmers, they need to be thinking about what's really going on. These huge ag companies, right? Um, people like us scraping by, they don't care about us. They no. haven't cared about us for a long time. And I hope that people make that that distinction in their head, right? We're not out here, you know, plowing behind a horse. That's not what's happening. These people have thousands of acres um, that they use to poison the rest of us. So, and I should add to that here, we hear politicians all the time talk about China, right? <laughs> Use all this scare tactics with China and China is doing this and doing that and they're coming to get Iowa farmland. Well, guess who owns a bunch of the hogs in both Iowa and Missouri, and Missouri. right? Yes. Smithfield Foods, that's a yes. Chinese company, right? Yes. They own a very large percentage of the hogs in both of our states. Right, And so these are the people that are polluting the water. These are the people that are polluting the water of rural people, rural small towns, right? So they can export uh, pork to China, right? But then we hear politicians, you know, here in Iowa, Joni Ernst is a big one, you know, all these scare tactics about China. Well, China's taken over much of our state. That's why my book is titled The Swine Republic. You know, we're a hey. swine republic. We're not a banana republic. We're a swine republic. Right. Smithfield. I've got a, a friend, this is a number of years ago, who I knew worked for Smithfield. I, I, I knew he was in some some level of management. He didn't work in the, the plant. I just knew he worked for Smithfield. And I knew he was gone a lot. He was gone a lot to China. The guy was in China. He would go for weeks at a time. That was my first introduction to even knowing that Smithfield was owned <laughs> and controlled by the, the Chinese. How does this impact rural water, and I know that August 7th, I want to get this in, August 7th at 6 p.m. at Big Grove Brewery in Iowa City, Iowa. Join Jess Piper and Chris Jones for a conversation on clean water and rural decline. And again, that's Wednesday, August 7th, 6 p.m. at Big Grove Brewery in Iowa City, Iowa. So how does how does the Chinese approach, where does that play into rural water? So if you're going to produce hogs for export like that, you're going to have to do it at a massive scale. And so, you know, the farmers raise these hogs on contract to the meat companies. Well, you know, they're one guy might be raising 5,000 or even 10,000 hogs. In Iowa, that's the average 5,000 per hog farmer. And so the amount of waste that they have to a cope with it's colossal, right? Five thousand hogs produces a waste of twenty thousand human beings, and you put one person in charge of managing that waste. Well, guess what? Bad things are going to happen. Yes, right. You're going to contaminate wells. You're going to contaminate streams and lakes, and so that's the consequence, right? And so, um, you know, we're using these states as sort of sacrifice zones, right? You know. Iowa, northern Missouri, other places in the Corn Belt, we're like West Virginia. Yes. Like West Virginia, where people with money come in and they extract the wealth from the land that is here, right? And they're extracting the wealth from the people that live here. And so this, the, the, the polluted water is just a symptom, right? The polluted water is just a symptom of what's happened here in these rural areas of the Corn Belt. And so it has to be seen in that light that it's a symptom of consolidation in agriculture and the takeover of agriculture by the big moneyed interests. And, you know, the small town America, small town people get left behind in all this, right? That These big ag people, they want to depopulate 
They do. They want to depopulate these rural areas so there's nobody there to complain about the dirty water and the yes. polluted rivers and so forth. I, 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 want, uh, I want to say that again, what you just said. I, I think you said it twice, and I think it, it warrants being said again. Big ag wants to depopulate yeah. rural areas. Absolutely. They, they want to push people out, which means that people who have enjoyed for generations of families living in a rural setting, living a, a different kind of life than what you live in urban areas. Look, they would farm cemeteries if they could. Right. <laughs> I'm not kidding you on that. They right. would plant corn in the cemeteries, in the schoolyards, and a town, a small town of a few hundred people is just in the way. It's in the way of what they want to do. Believe and, me, that is true. I can tell you that what Chris is saying is 100% true because Betsy DeVos, we all know her. Yes. She, you know, and she pushes school vouchers and school choice. And a reporter asked her, what does school choice look like in a rural area? Because they don't have choice. And she said, well, I think it sounds like a kid listening to great books on headphones um, while they're working in the fields and then going to the John Deere plant and getting an apprenticeship and then getting tutored at night. So with that statement, she has told you, my kids aren't worth educating and there should be no brick and mortar building in this town. Just like Chris said, get, dig it all up, right? Plow it all up and plant corn here because that's what they want. And the people that are still here, guess what they're going to do? They're going to mine the field, right? Um, right? But she's she obviously knows nothing about um, you know agriculture because a 10-year-old won't be on a combine, I hope. Um, but just to further the fact that all of this is intertwined, everything is always intertwined, but, um, you know, the, the water quality, the air quality and rule decline, um, you know, hospitals going away, schools going away. It's all to do what Chris was saying, get these folks out so we can do what we want to do. Right. And a lot of these people are not, you know, we, we're selling land, farmland to, to foreign nationals. Um, one of the, the guy who's probably going to win the primary for governor in Missouri, his name is Mike Kehoe. He's going on this big rampage about, you know, selling farmland to China. Guess what he did in 2013? He voted twice to sell land to China. And guess what? He's driving around the state in this huge bus that um, has, you know, his name all over it. And the local paper just found out that that bus was paid for by a pork lobbyist who happens to do business in China. So it's just like it'll make your head explode. It, they, it they flat out lie. They just lie. And they don't care about any of us. That That's it. I, I think for a lot of these issues, it, it comes down to being that simple. They, they will lie about anything. They will run on issues that they have done the opposite in terms of their own choices and what they've voted for. Um, and and it's, it's like they live in two separate realities, the one they actually function in and then the one they tell us they function in so they can get elected and get into office. And at that point, I, I think we're seeing more and more of this. You know, it used to be that once somebody was in office, they at least kind of tried to make it look like they were working with, with both sides, right? Once somebody's in office now, it, it's not that way. There's There's no shame in saying, you know what, I'm here to represent this, this truth, not so much you. And people fall for it time and time and time again. You know, you'd, you'd mentioned earlier, Chris, about there people when they're talking about farmers and farms that we're not talking about the, the farmer from 1960, 1970, where the family all, you know, they throughout the summer, they did things like cut 
and bale hay. And, you know, when I was in high school, when I played football and ran track, we almost always had three or four kids that kind of a special arrangement with the coach. If practice was going to run a little long, they got to leave because they had to go home and milk. They, they had to go home and milk. They worked. They were an integral part of that family's business. That's, I don't know in, any people in my community who are dairymen anymore. They're gone. So dairy has been one of the biggest sectors of agriculture uh, where there's been consolidation, right? And so we hear uh, about in Iowa and Minnesota and Wisconsin, a lot of dairy in all three states. And there's, you know, dozens of dairies that go out, go out of business every month, right? More than a thousand a year, I, I think I hear in Wisconsin. And so this consolidation, this get big or get out, right? That is uh, began with it when Earl Butts was Secretary of Agriculture during the Nixon years, and that was the mantra: get bigger, get out, and that's the way it's been. And so uh, now we see, you know, agriculture uh, they they like to they'd like to have their neighbor's land more than they'd like to have a neighbor, right? Right. <laughs> that's the way it is, and right. and so. We've we've set up this model of agriculture in the United States where, <clears throat> especially in the Corn Belt, unless you're really big, you know, you got no business trying to do this. And so <clears throat> we need to change the framework of agriculture. As, Je as Jeff said, the price of agri the price of land is really expensive. Seventeen thousand in Missouri, uh, twenty five thousand or more per acre in Iowa is not unheard of. And so. We make it impossible for people to break into the business. As a consequence, the average age of the farmer in Iowa is about 60. And so these guys have a lot of wealth, uh, a lot of generational wealth, as Jess talks about, and young people that would like to do something different and to grow other crops and take care of the land in ways that are more environmentally sound, they can't break in. And so we need policy that changes this framework that designs an agricultural system that's focused on human nutrition and environmental outcomes. Right now, we have a system that's focused on commerce, and that commerce does not benefit the small-time rural person, okay? And so we need policy at the federal level to change this framework. You know, as you were talking about it, focusing on human nutrition, it, what came to mind was, I think, the 1970s, somewhere in there, Charlton Heston, Soylent Green, right? <laughs> yeah. Where where there was, there was a food shortage, and so to be able to feed everybody, the people who were dying were processed into food, and that was what was called Soylent Green. But that's not really a crazy stretch, is it? I, I mean, when we think... Look, we produce a lot of calories in this country. And so right now, I've heard the number tossed around, agriculture world, worldwide produces enough calories for 11 billion people right now. And so there's about 7 or 8 billion on Earth. Think about this. More calories, more calories... In the are in the corn that goes to produce ethanol in the United States than what we put in our body. All right, so we're committing more calories to ethanol than what we put in our body. So we grow plenty of stuff in this country. The problem is we grow a lot of bad stuff. <laughs> and look, uh, you know, we have an overweight uh, country, right? Um, half the country is overweight or even a greater percentage of that. Think about it. When you were, when I was growing up, were there obese kids in school? No, there were not. There were no obese kids. Right. And so, you know, we're, we're doing something wrong here. Yeah. The evidence, the evidence is out there. It's easily observable. We need to change our agricultural and our food production systems. 
I know the rates of juvenile diabetes have been yeah. skyrocketing for for years now. So I was glad to hear you address a focus on human nutrition because <laughs> it seems like there's a focus on everything but. But I, I was glad to hear you say that we produce or we grow a, a lot. It's not that there's not the land for. It's not that we couldn't grow enough to 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 feed everyone. But we might get into a situation where we are looking at not everyone's getting the kind of nutrition that they need to get because of the choices we are making about what we are growing on that land and what it's for. We um, have food insecurity in this country. We do. We have food insecurity, especially in rural areas. It's criminal that we have food insecurity in this country, considering how much of our country is devoted to agriculture and how yes. much we produce. And so we need a system that's good for people, right? We need a system that's good for people and that serves the common good. We don't have that. Well, and I think a part good. of that, yeah, it's when Chris talks about food insecurity and I live in this rural area and I worked in schools all my life. So when you and when all three of us were in school, we had um, women in general who cooked food, real food. They yes. cooked chili, you know, they made soups, they made food. We don't have that anymore in rural areas. We have a woman, one woman who is hired to heat up food because they don't have ovens, right? Right. They just heat it up. So they're tearing things out of plastic and putting it on a pan and heating it up and then giving it to the kids. So all of this is, you know, it all goes together. If we're feeding kids donuts for breakfast, and they do, if we're feeding them Pop-Tarts, they do, this is, you know, the natural outcome. Um, and it's all related to the fact that we have defunded these schools and we don't care about these kids. And feed them donuts three times a day. Who cares? Right. My so wife. When, when you feed kids that way, you've got to do it in a way that's calorie dense. Right. And so I I heard Jess say one time, I can't remember when. Well, uh, they would make a big pot of chili in the school lunchroom. And that's what the kids ate. And if you're going to feed kids out of packages, well, guess what? It's going to be calorie dense. It's going to be salty. It's going to be sugary. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that it's had this effect on our bodies should not be a surprise. And and isn't that something too? Coming back to you as a scientist, we've we've known that for a long time too, have we not? Oh yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's mind blowing to me all of these things that we not only know, but we've known for decades in some cases, and yet nobody addresses it. And it, not only does it not change it, it continues to get worse. And that's what the two of you are going to talk about on August 7th in Iowa City, Iowa, at the Big Grove Brewery, August 7th, 6 p.m. You're going to talk about some of these issues and kind of lay out a, a blueprint, I guess, maybe, for what people can do. Because this isn't that at the end of the day, and this is for both of you, you you come forward with these uh, stories and, and the ideas about where it's taking us and, and the ways that that's not good for us. But ultimately, the people who you are talking to, the people listening to this podcast, the people who are going to vote, it takes all of us taking action. Is that a fair statement? That, that if we just do a podcast where the three of us talk to each other about it and nobody listening takes that information and decides to, to get involved, that we've really just spent some time talking to one another. Unless and, people take action. And that's the thing. And I think that's why I garner so much unwanted attention is that I, I'm doing the thing that they refuse to do. Democrats left rural America. And that's a fact. But guess who else did? The Republicans. 
Nobody's knocking my door, calling me or asking for a vote. It's just people are in information silos out here. And it's a, it's red versus blue. It's who's going to win, right? But right. when you knock the doors and you talk to the people and you give them sense, everything in their brain is scrambled. And here's the thing. A lot of people are in information silos and they get on Facebook and they see a lot of people get their news from Facebook. God on us, right? So they sure. get, on, they get yeah. on Facebook and they're reinforced with their beliefs. But when I knock on their door, and I taught their kid or their grandkid, and they're forced to face something that causes, you know, a little bit of discomfort, it really makes a difference. And that's why I, we have to run everywhere. We cannot cede grounds to people who don't care about us anymore. And we have to talk to our neighbors. And podcasts are fantastic because there are people that are going to listen to it. But I want those people to go out and knock a door or talk to their neighbor while they're outside or doing the things they're doing because that's how we make change is showing up. And friends, I, I talked to so many people that weren't registered to vote that are just so apathetic and not children. I mean, these were grown adults, I, right? And so these are things we have to say. I, I post about this often. I know for a fact, because I live in a small community, you, you see things, you see what happens and what does not happen. And a large percentage of the people with the, the uh, Make America Get Great Again flags or bumper stickers, they don't vote. In fact, they're not registered to vote. Right. It's it's mind blowing. However, if we go back to 2016, we know how many Democrats did not vote. Stay home in that election. And to your point, Jess, about that face to face, I, I, I know that on a national stage, um, human touch. Has has become unfortunately a, a touchy uh, issue, so to speak. And yet, in these rural areas where we grew up, uh, it, it, it's it's still a part of of life, right? You you see somebody and you hug them and and uh, touch them on the arm, and you don't ask first, and it's okay, and it's just it's it's rural life, and the difference that can make when I speak to somebody in my community who has different beliefs or comes from a, a, a different stance on politics than I do, when I'm close enough that I can reach out and, and touch them on the shoulder and look into their eyes from a distance close enough, I can see their, their pupils changing. There's something different that happens. And it's like this magical power of being able to get somebody to truly listen and to be receptive in a way they're not online. Because it's so easy to just click and move on. Click, boom, boom, boom. So, yes, the point that you're, you're making, we've got to get out. And as you mentioned, that's that's the hard part. It's not hard. But it is compared to just sitting down with a mouse in your hand or your phone in your hand. So we need to be able to bump people up and out. And even if you go out for 30 minutes a day and talk to people, can you imagine the impact 30 minutes a day? I mean, you can even do it while you're doing something else. You go to the grocery store, you, you're at the swimming pool, wherever you are, if you will just spend part of that time casually, you know, it's not like you've got to go and say, I'm so-and-so and I'm here to talk about. You can just strike up a conversation and then softly work it in. And people generally will listen. What, what are you going to address specifically August 7th? Well, again, my main point here is the the environmental consequences that are happening in rural Iowa and elsewhere are just a symptom, right? They're a symptom of what's happened to rural areas. And what is what has happened? Well, we've had a takeover by the big moneyed interests of our rural areas, and they've turned these states in the in the Corn Belt into extractive sorts of places and they're there to extract the wealth 
And when they extract the wealth, it's bad for rural people and it's bad for the environment. So that's my main message on okay. August. And, and Jess, uh, you you essentially mirroring that message and and offering your viewpoints on it. Yeah, just you know, as living living the life for all of my life and raising kids here. Um, and just realizing, you know, in the last decade or so, how things are really not for us, how things are meant to be against us and the decline in our communities. I mean, my town has 480 people in it. I I write a sub stack. And so I was going to write about our local school and how it's defunded. So I went back and was looking at the history. And it's it's unbelievable how many people used to live in this town. I have to drive 25 minutes for a gallon of milk. We don't have any place to buy milk. I can buy cigarettes or I can buy beer, sure. gas, um, but I can't buy, you know, a gallon of milk. There were two grocery stores here. There was a bank. There was a place to buy clothes. There was a barber shop. And now we have, you know, a post office and a convenience store and um, state line liquor, right? Yes. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's that's what they've that's what they've reduced us to. Um, and so those are the things I'm going to talk about. Fantastic. I, I, I just said to my wife, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I we have a business that left. And uh, I said, well, this is this is a great look for people driving through another empty storefront. And I said, well, one thing you can count on that that won't leave. And it's the uh, we call it the smoke shop yes. and then the liquor store. You know that those are going to be there no, no matter what. But to your point, Jess, when I was a kid, and I, I was born in 66, but uh, I, I look at my my childhood as the 70s. Right. The town that I now live in which is where I grew up, it was bustling. It, it, had, um, it had two taxi services, right? Now, it's only a town of about 6,000 people, but I think at that time it was closer to eight. But as you know, when you are talking about a small community, the injection of an additional 2,000 people mm -hmm changes things yeah. incredibly and you know it was just a neat little place to grow up and live now there's a skeletal structure where there used to be this bustling thriving little community and it's so sad to see and one thing i i want to tell to the viewers because i think it 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 can show just how much what Chris and Jess have both talked about, about big ag taking over. When I was a kid, I used to go uh, quail hunting with my grandparents, right? And my grandfather worked for at what was called Missouri Public Service, you might remember. And it was the electrical company, right? He used to be a lineman, so he knew people all throughout several counties. We had an almost unlimited number of places where we could go hunt quail. When I got back from the military, I'd, I'd kind of dropped out of hunting, I guess, during my military years. But when I came back, people would ask me, you still hunt? And my answer would always be the same. Where? All of the places that I used to go hunt that was privately owned, that people would say, sure, just be sure you close the gate. It was gone. Mm -hmm. It was owned by, and I'd say, okay, they'd say, well, uh, this outfit owns this place we're used to hunt. And I'd say, okay, well, I'll check with so-and-so. Well, it owns them too. I'll check that. It owns all. So, as Chris mentioned earlier, they come in and gobble up as much land as they can buy. And the, the price is $17,000 an acre. In high school, I know places where I could have bought all the land I wanted for, for $500 an acre, right? And scrub ground, they'd almost give it away so they didn't have to pay property taxes. 
on it anymore. And of course, all that is now leased out to people from out of state who come in to hunt. So the idea of, oh yeah, that's Nick's uncle. They own that. Yeah, they'll let you mushroom hunt there. Those days are gone. So in the 80s, you could have bought a farm for $17,000. <laughs> yes. I'm not, I'm not kidding you on that. Yes. You know, land in Iowa was 200 and some dollars an acre. As far as the quail, we don't have any quail left in Iowa because we've farmed fence row to fence row. And so all these uh, marginal lands that were a habitat for quail and pheasants are gone now. Right. You know, now we have deer hunting. Of course, deer like to eat corn and soybeans. And so we have a lot of deer around that people can shoot. But as far as the bird hunting, the quail, they're gone. Yes. So I think, you know, in this context, so I just did a little looking around here before I came on here. In Iowa, we have 1,022 cities, 1,022 communities. Um, only 42 of those have a population greater than 10,000. 982 out of 1,022, less than 10,000 people. And so do we want everybody in the state living in these little islands, these little urban islands? I don't think we do. We want a prosperous rural area. And so often we look at prosperity in terms of the farmer, right? So there's only 85,000 farmers in Iowa, but you know, half of our state is living in a town of less than 10,000 people. And so we have to divorce this idea of rural is the same as farmer. Those okay. things are not the same thing. Yeah. This is something that Democrats do just do not get. And so we need to come in and we need to talk to rural people in the context of What's good for everybody? What's good for the town? What's good for the common good? Not what's good for you. What's good for the common good here? What's good for the town? And I think that's what Democrats need to do if they're going to make inroads into these rural areas. And is it safe to say that people who live in those rural communities are really the last bastion between? a takeover, a complete takeover, and um, being able to maintain rural communities. Do we want these corporate titans uh, having control over, you know, 90% of the land in a state? I don't. I don't want that. I think that's dumb, <laughs> you know, yeah. to hand yeah. over 90% of a state's area to a few billionaires. That's dumb. Right. right. We don't well, want we that. And so about that, a, we need to br bring prosperity to these rural areas. Let, let's talk about on a human level, on just the experience of life, Jess. You, you grew up in a rural setting. What does it mean to your family if through some change of events as the, re the result of big ag, that your family has to pick up and move to the city, as we say here in the sticks. If you have to, to move to a, a larger urban area with a, a neighbor on either side, 15 feet from your house this way and 15, 20 feet that way, what does that mean for your quality of life based on what you've known, what you've enjoyed, and, and, and psychologically, how, how would that impact you? I, I don't know what it's like to live like that. And I like the way I live right now. And could I do it? Of course I could. I mean, I guess getting a gallon of milk would be a lot easier. Um, and my daughter, my daughter would probably have a better uh, funded school. But this is the point to this is that um, when people say, and I know you didn't say it, but people will often tell me, just move, you know, just, just move. move. It's my state too. I'm not going anywhere. This is my state too, right? right? And I have a right to live where I want to live, like all of us do. I've chosen the life that I've always lived. Um, the, I mean, my house costs thirty thousand dollars. My right. house and my property costs thirty thousand dollars. As teachers, I could afford to live here. I could afford. I now am mortgage free, right? The house yes. across the highway went for twenty thousand. 
five beds, one bath, right? right? We can afford to live here. And what Chris said is so important. I wrote about this. Rural people are not farmers. There's no, you don't need to, like people misconstrue that. Rural people in general are poor folks who live in communities that they can afford to live in, right? Yes. Um, and so it's when we really come down to it, it, it is class warfare. It's the billionaires against the poor folks who are still in this place. Um, and so talking to my neighbors, they know that when Chris talks to people out in his area, we all know what we're up against because, you know, this this is the way we've always lived. And we see who is coming in and, and buying up the land and the fact that our kids. I mean, my kids could afford to live out here, but there's no jobs here. <laughs> So that makes yeah. it difficult, right? So they live right. they live in Kansas City where, you know, it's it costs twenty two or, you know, two hundred thousand dollars to buy something that's a fixer upper. We have a lot of problems in the country. They're they're mirrored in rural areas, um, just like anywhere else. Right. And I I think you would both agree that if we lose if we lose that element of the, the rural people, if we lose that, we lose an important thread in the fabric of our country, right? Because what is a country if it's not the collage of all of the different lifestyles and people who, right, we've, we've got the big city life, and and that's an important thing. There are a lot of important things that happen in big cities, and we need them. And those people bring something to the table, not just in terms of their their job and what they do, but just their personalities. and And you can tell a big city person from a a rural person, right? We we need all of us. And if if you wipe away the rural people in this nation, I, I think it goes in a direction that you can't count on as being a good uh, direction because there's such a, a, a grassroots element to rural life and rural people. So one last time before we go. Join Jess Piper and Chris Jones for a conversation on clean water and rural decline. Wednesday, August 7th, 6 p.m. at Big Grove Brewery in Iowa City, Iowa. Jess, Chris, either of you want to say one last thing before we go? Well, I just want to say I'm really uh, happy and proud to be associated with somebody like Jess Piper, who clearly is a leader here knows way more about uh, rural life in uh, the Midwest than I do. And I think she's somebody to listen to and that can inform people both in, in Missouri and in Iowa. And so I'm really happy to do this event with her. And I hope people come and, and I hope we can help people learn about a few things. And I'm really excited about it. And I was happy the first time um, I got to go, even though I was like, why are they including me? <laughs> this is fantastic, though. And thank you for, for hosting us and um, for telling other people about the event. Oh, you're so welcome. And and Jess, I know that's, you've said that a couple of times now. You said, you know, I thought, well, why are they including me? <laughs> I, I, I think the, the really important and nice thing about you being there is, let's face it, most people aren't scientists, right? I mean, a scientist is so critical in the decisions that are being made because, again, they're the, they're the people we go to when we want to sort out the different opinions and beliefs, right? They're the people who are going to have the answer that we should probably be listening to. But yet, not everybody's a scientist. And so to have somebody there Who's, who's not a scientist? You know, I think if it were two scientists, I think maybe people would feel differently about the event. I think if there were no scientists, people would feel differently about the event. The two of you are kind of like the dynamic duo. You, yes. you balance things out. And, and I think that will make for a, a great event. So I might interject here. Most people are not trained scientists. 
<laughs> most there people are scientists. Most people are scientists. There you go. They have an instinctive uh, sort of grasp of the scientific method. Now, in our society, we've tried, you know, and the, the scientific community is guilty of this. We've made science off limits to uh, general audiences. And so that's one thing we will definitely be doing there. August 7th is making the science uh, accessible to the general audience. Super. Well, it's been my honor to to have both of you and to, to get to meet both of you officially, or at least as officially as you can <laughs> digitally, right? But we're at least face-to-face in real time. And it has been a pleasure. So one last time, join Jess Piper and Chris Jones for a conversation on clean water and rural decline, Wednesday, August 7th, 6 p.m. at Big Grove Brewery. I don't know why I have such a hard time saying Big Grove <laughs> Brewery in Iowa City, Iowa. Uh, I'd like to have you both back in the future sometime to uh, maybe expand on some of the issues that we talked about. I apologize for the technical issues, but I assure you I will try to do a little magic and and piece everything together as as smoothly as as we can, and then I will send you uh, the link so you can share with your people. All right. Thank you, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.